All right, we got um, some peacocks that also live around there as well. Um, if you saw this, this is one of the uh, derivatives of the technology that we're working on. Um, it's a self-watering uh, aquaponics raft, but we'll talk a little bit more about modular architecture later on in the talk. That's my son, help me, like I said, I'll put you to work. Put a six-year-old to work. All right, the company that I'm gonna be talking about first is Ripple Aerospace. Um, we're based on Norway, we've got our CTO in the room somewhere, Daniel, wherever Daniel is. There he is, what's up buddy? Really intelligent guy, if you have any questions about the systems involved, just get with me or him, we'd be happy to talk to you about it. Um, part of the Ripple advantage that we like to talk about are sea launch vehicles, which have been under development since the 1960s, um, funded primarily by NASA and uh, led by an engineer named uh, Robert Truax. His son Scott actually just uh, worked on this thing called Return to Snake uh, River Canyon, where they actually were able to do what Evil can Evil couldn't, and that's launch a manned rocket over Snake River Canyon. It's really cool. You should check it out on YouTube. Yeah, it's very impressive. Um, we are able to launch more tonnage doing sea launch than you can from terrestrial based launchers. So if we can just get past the whole idea that, you know, of launching out of the ocean, you'll find it's economically more feasible and technologically possible. And that's what we're going for. This is a picture of the rocket. As you can see, we like to use aerospike engines. That's the ballast cap. Um, and those are the auxiliary engines. We'll go over a little bit more of the breakdown in a further slide. Um, the Sea Serpent one's gonna be uh, about 33 meters tall. Um, for us Americans in the room, that's 108 feet. Um, <laughs> or a non-scientist for that matter. Um, yeah, it can do about a two to 2.6 metric tons to orbit. So we're definitely hitting a small sat rocket or a small sat market. And we should be ready to fly in about 2020. Um, this winter, we're gonna start our first uh, trials for the sounding rocket, which is gonna be a scale model. And we're gonna prove it works and then we're gonna go and see if we can get some valuation funding. Um, the company is based in Norway. Our CEO, Christopher Leland, is currently at IAC and the rest of the team's gonna be meeting up with him later this week. Um, they have a long history of seafaring tradition. Um, their primary source of income is uh, oil and gas exploration. So um, doing sea launch platforms and maritime operations is something that they've had a lot of experience doing. And we're gonna be leveraging that when we design our rockets in the seaports or in the uh, dry docks, I should say. And um, we won't need any new launch infrastructure to do that, which is the really cool part. Uh, we use existing launch infrastructure. We don't need to go rent out a launch pad. We don't need to go fight over pad 39A like uh, SpaceX and Blue Origin are doing right now. So, this is, would be a uh, picture of what such a facility would look like um, mid 2020s. Um, we like to think of it this way. Land launch vehicles are range constrained or yeah, I can say constrained, but they're contained. Um, sea launches are range liberated. Um, you, d you tow a rocket out to any <coughs> point in water and you're gonna be able to do it, especially in international waters where you're not subject to the same laws and regulations as you'd find in the United States or you know, other you know, major spacefaring nations, the small community that does do it. This also allows you to start going after some of the smaller markets who might want to just purchase some rockets who might not have the um, you know, tax base to fund their own space program. Uh, you can do something like what, uh, Jack, what uh, with the Japanese government, like what the um, American, um, I guess, uh, the American fighter, uh, the uh, American fighter jet, the F-16, did when we actually exported some of the technology to the Japanese for the F-2 fighter. <coughs> um, Propulsion-wise and structurally-wise, it is pretty much an F-16. The rest of it was made indigenously in Japan, and we're kind of following that model uh, when we're discussing how to kind of export this rocket technology to other countries. Yeah, and we, uh, we're gonna integrate with the intermodal shipping system to do this. Again, seaports, that's the beauty of this. Um, imagine being able to have FedEx pick up your satellite, put it on a train, and then just drop it right off at the seaport where it's gonna go from one crane to the other. Uh, it's gonna get picked up by a crane and drop directly into where your loading bay is for your rocket. It provides a lot of launch options, which you may not find elsewhere, and it allows for on-demand service and ride sharing, of course. Um, again, we were talking about the shipyards. Um, we don't need to manufacture anything beyond what shipyards can provide and we, we can deploy with an aerospace assembly building. It's really exciting to be a part of this company because there are not many out there who might have the potential to be a billion dollar rocket company and the team thinks we found one and we're gonna keep driving on it and we're gonna be, you're gonna be hearing a lot more from us. I may have read some of our articles that recently came out in Parabolic Arc and Inverse. Again, this is the rocket. We have the ballast cap, first stage. Second stage, and of course, the nose cone. It's gonna deploy off. Some really good videos of that. 
um, and we're going to have more out again a couple months from now. Um, if you have any questions, please stop me in the middle of this, and I'll be happy to answer it. I won't be offended. So um, again, we're going to be, uh, okay. yes, sir. Yeah, um, those are going to be mitigated by having this uh, ballast cap right here. And plus, there's going to be support infrastructure. It's not, you're not just going to tow this thing out with a tugboat. There are going to be a launch and range control system. There are going to be maintenance, offer, you know, maintenance officers on board, making sure that this rocket's going to be done correctly. And that all, um, you know, we're also going to be able to just check the weather, you know, a couple, you know, week ahead of time, make sure that the launch window is going to be good for that. Um, and it also provides you the flexibility to abort. If you abort on a pad that's being used by other companies, then your launch might get bumped back because other people are going to be needing to use it next time you're able to launch. Um, in the ocean, you don't have that uh, issue. Um, I'm just going to move forward. Um, the Aerospike engines are being developed in the United States by Rocket Star. Um, they are a New York-based company, and they're going to be doing uh, tests out in Florida. Um, the great thing about it is um, it's, it's uh, scalable. Um, it's uh, thrust cell failure redundancy means that even if you lose one or two of them, you're you still have enough um, impulse to allow you to hit wherever you need to go for your stage separation, orbital insertion, and eventually, you know, deployment of your payload. Um, the engine, uh, the way it's designed itself is uh, altitude pressure compensating, uh, which means the higher it goes, you're going to be dealing with lower air pressures around it. For example, if you notice uh, with a bell nozzle rocket engine, you have, it gets much wider as it goes up. Um, that is able to compensate because of the architecture and design. Uh, and the effects that, you know, the aerospike provides. Let's talk about Mars a little bit because this is the Mars Society, so now we're going to kind of switch gears just slightly. Um, we're looking at a p potential, um, well, we're actually looking for somebody who might want to land something on Phobos because we really believe, or at least I personally believe especially, um, that um, the, the moon itself, you can, uh, it makes uh, multiple crosses on the surface a day. Its ground track is only about 50, 5,300 miles an hour, so maybe about seven or 8,000 kilometers an hour. And as you can see in this graphic, um, it allows you to hit your um, escapes and uh, you know, insertions to uh, go to your destination, whether or not you're sending things up the, gra the solar system gravity well or back down. Um, and of course, if you know, you're wanting to head to Mars, it's a lot easier to catch something going 5,000 miles an hour than it would having you know, break, you know, make a, you know, make a uh, you know, orbital you know, maneuver whatnot. Um, okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some technologies that derived from it. Um, NASA actually tried the, uh, the AC launch aerospike a couple of years ago. Um, unfortunately, it lost out to SLS. Uh, There's a lot of people who worked on it. Um, one of the interesting things about that is if you can see right here, just how cheap it, you can actually deliver if you do the system right and you do it scaled. And this would be for a 140 metric ton version. Um, these numbers are a little outdated. If you see uh, what SpaceX is now, I don't currently know what their offering is. Maybe, Dan, do you know what SpaceX is? Uh, now, because of the FT version, it's like $2,800 a kilo. Like, they're just, they have the market. It's yeah. Un <laughs> it's back at this point. They do. And um, the interesting thing, though, is um, because we're doing the sea launch the way that we were talking about that architecture, we can drive pro costs down a lot more. We're not planning on doing any sort of man-rated vehicles, purely cargo. And, a lot, and therefore, you, have, you lose a lot of the overhead that you might have to invest otherwise in it. This is the concept of operations for that system. As you can tell, we don't have to worry about the uh, payload and mass penalties, or the mass penalties of doing a controlled en uh, entry, descent, and landing. You're simply just dropping it into the ocean, recovering it, refueling it, and launching it again. And this is what it would look like um, under you know, mission circumstances. OK, um, talking about Mars a little bit. We are looking for people, uh, especially um, researchers, who might want to deliver something out to Mars who might not have the um, finances to you know, um, go to your ULAs or your SpaceXs. We can deliver with this system in 2020, 2021, uh, about 70 kilograms on a trans-Martian insertion. So if somebody was to develop, say, a common uh, Martian lander bus, we'd be able to deploy that for them. And from there, they'd be able to you know, take it over once you know, um, you know, the launch operations are done. And we are actively looking for people willing to partner with us on that. So if you, if you are in this room, or if you're watching on live stream, or you just happen to you know, catch us at a later time, let us know if that's something we would love to sign a LOI with you or a payload user agreement. 
All right, that's what we're going to talk about Ripple. Now we're going to switch over to what the main topic of this top is, talk is, and that's offshore, the biosphere and green, the cosmos. This uh, image right here is uh, called The Prologue and the Promise um, by Robert McCall, who's a major inspiration of mine. Uh, I believe you can find this image at the Epcot Center down in Florida. And it is in that spirit that we are, you know, what inspires me to do this job that I'm doing, and I'm very blessed to be doing it. Um, history of life on this planet, as you can see, these images are going to be kind of self-explanatory. There's only so much you can say. Um, but, you know, um, when talking about a directed panspermia, um, entropy itself, because of the cool, uh, complexity self-arranges in a cooling, uh, or self-arranges to mitigate entropy. So that's why you have a, a system that to conserve heat will become more complex. And that's what we're seeing, you know, with uh, evolution and life on this planet. Um, you can call the pre, I like to call the uh, Cambrian explosion the biological singularity because uh, to borrow a term from uh, the technology community, um, what came before the Cambrian era, no way could you have guessed what would happen afterward. You had a proliferation of life on this planet, the likes of which we haven't seen since and we haven't seen and we may not see again, even with the advent of synthetic biology. But of course, life becomes more complex. Some, some animals do. You still have your jellyfish <laughs> and dinosaurs. But of course, you know, being that we're all inclined towards the space community, we see the dangers of being a one planet species. And then, you know, of course, we come to primates. Then you have your jellyfish, humans. Um, yeah, th this, uh, this slide illustrates, you know, yeah, you know, some, some say that some of us still are. <laughs> maybe, maybe they're the spineless ones among us. Uh, none in this room, of course. Um, so what we have here, you know, of course, is the system itself edging towards complexity. And it could possibly happen elsewhere, you know, in this universe as well. What comes next? Some people might think it's artificial intelligence. Some might, some might see a hybrid between the two. All we know is that, you know, we're humans and we are here. Unfortunately, there's some limitations to that. For example, a human without protection is no more different than another animal without protection. That's why we need spacesuits, that's why we need habitats. The question is, what do you do in a toxic environment when your biology is essentially the same whether or not you're an insect or a mammal on this planet? Terran life is Terran life and therein lies the problem. Um, Earth's biosphere. Uh, another thing that we're looking at and I find very interesting, especially in regards to TREAD, is trying to pick off where Biosphere 2 left off. There's a lot of lessons to be learned. There's a lot of mistakes that they made. Um, of course, you know, through mistakes, that's how you improve, so you know, make them again. For example, make sure your concrete cures before you send people in, you know, for a closed, you know, experiment or whatever. Um, I'm ready to do it. I'm ready to start building the next version now. Oh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I would have to talk to material scientists about that. I'm sure we can come to some sort of compromise. Yeah, plastic. There you go. Or glass for that matter. Maybe they should just add more glass. It looks like they had a lot of it. I pro I pro I, for me personally, I would have just buried half the structure and not had to deal with it at all. You know, um, speaking of networks, though, um, we find that uh, distributed networks are probably the best way to do this. A centralized system is what you see in a lot of um, everyday, or I shouldn't say everyday, mundane um, life support systems on spacecraft, where you have your power supply, you have everything integrated into it, and if one part of that system fails, the entire system fails. You know, um, same applies for how you would have a society off-world, on Mars, on the moon, you know, and elsewhere. Um, centralization at some point will always fragment. It'll become decentralized. Um, does it go to distributed? Not always. Um, in fact, distributed networks might be the only way to actually have um, a long-term multi-planetary species that can work. It's where every node is self-sufficient, but at the same time can, you know, support the rest of the system. All right, let's talk a little bit about our system now. Why crater? Well, you have water, mineral ore deposits. You can go to an asteroid to collect your uh, mineral ores, or you can go where the asteroid kindly delivered itself to the surface to mine. Um, you have your natural UV radiation shielding. Um, ideal geomorphology. Now, I was thinking, you know, Mars would be areomorphology. I don't know. Spell check said it's not a word, so <laughs> I used it anyway. Um, what you can do is, when, you know, with the shape of the crater itself, you can actually use it to kind of concentrate light on a central, on a central uh, dome, per, per, per se. Um, I'll show you a, a graphic of that in an upcoming slide. Um, 
Again, going back to distributed networks, though, um, I use this image. Okay, I googled Percival Lowell's Canali, which obviously didn't happen, but it you know got me thinking. You know, what if you were to actually connect Martian settlements um, with these semi, with either in completely enclosed trenches or semi-enclosed trenches? Because from there, you can actually transport water materials on the surface without having to do EVAs and the risks inherent with that. Um, so that got me thinking, um, you know, what can you do to enable robust pair terraforming of the planet? And um, so a colleague of mine who actually met in Japan, uh, Nicholas Carlo, who's a complexity theorist and um, socio-ecological uh, life support systems uh, researcher, uh, we came up with some solutions for that. And it ultimately uh, came down to something like this. Um, the image was, um, we brought this image to a artist, uh, some of you might have heard of him, his name's Douglas Schrock. Uh, really awesome guy, brilliant. Um, uh, was able to uh, work with us on, so on some of these designs. I ended up having to use my rudimentary skills for the rest because, you know, obviously when you're a Martian space researcher, researcher uh, budgets are a little tight. So I only got one image and I just had to kind of doctor the rest. Um, we were talking a little bit about, you know, what uh, connects these nodes. I actually call them Lowell trenches. Um, it presents a unique solution across the Martian, you know, Martian service, like we said. Um, the network itself can remain pressurized over long distances. Um, what you're seeing right here is actually the dome removed, so you can kind of see what's going on inside. Um, you would have a silicate or aluminum oxide pressurized transparent roof. Um, transparent aluminum, you actually, some of you might have it in your pocket. It's uh, sapphire glass. Um, of course, you have your trench walls, as you can see here. Um, your canali, that's what I call them. Um, and uh, on the, you know, your exposed regolith and uh, rock matrix basin. Uh, you can transit the surface of Mars barefoot, and I think that's kind of a cool way to do it um, because spacesuits, you know, they might get kind of itchy. They get kind of hot when you're on, you know, 40 mile trek. So being able to do that, or at least walk along a uh, river canyon, uh, might pose, you know, some, a different way to think about, you know, what it's like to live on Mars when you finally get up there. We're going to have excavation equipment, and they're going to be put to use. So let's try to find all the ways that we can to use them. So uh, I use kind of this image as an analog where you would have that deep, you know, that deep trench, you know, capped. And it would allow you to transport what you want across the surface. Um, an issue that could be brought up is um, what do you do in the event of a depressurization? And that's why um, you probably would want some, you know, uh, walls or bulkheads, uh, maybe between nodes, uh, maybe every, you know, couple hundred meters or every couple of thousand meters, depending on how well traversed it is. So let's go. This would be uh, what one such uh, system looks like. Um, again, we have our, um, we call it a Yochi. Oh, oh, well, let's, let's kind of speed up a little bit then. Okay, so this is the system. Um, we have here, so I guess, some, uh, some uh, CAD schematics of what it would look like to have your agricultural zone. Um, these units are uh, three modified. Um, they're called a Ganunga Gap, which is actually a uh, borrowed uh, Scandinavian term. I'll uh, show you a little bit of that in a second here. So um, you have something, um, I guess it would be your Muspelheim. It's um, the hell of fire and heat. Uh, it's your solar electrothermal black body for water treatment, evaporation, collection. Um, the, um, oh, I'm sorry, the Niflheim. My bad. Scandinavian words. I'm still learning them, by the way, with Riffle. Um, it's uh, modeled after the uh, Yellowstone uh, caldera, um, where... Um, Nick, when he was doing some research, saw that there was a hot spring there and messages me about it. So that sparked a whole brainstorm that lasted maybe two or three months with us. And this was eventually what we came up with. Um, you have a solar thermal black body on one end, a heat sink on the other, and in, and in the center you have something that can cycle your hydrothermal system. And it would be completely temperate and you can live inside those excavated trenches like we were saying. Um, and of course, it also allows you, because of the thermoelectric effect, you know, to have it generate some electricity for you that wasn't done by solar. So again, you have your ice cap on one end, your onsen, if anybody knows, uh, it's a hot spring in Japan, um, on one end, and then where you live in the middle. And this is Terran Analog Systems Modeling. Again, this is the system. Um, it's the Yochi. A lot of it's uh, based off the work of uh, Bucky Fuller, Gerard K. O'Neill, uh, Fresco, Paulo Santori, Biosphere 2 team. Um, of course, I can show you. I can share with you guys these slides if you want a more detailed explanation. I realize that we're run, kind of running out of time here. Um, so this is how it would work. Essentially, you have the solar collectors um, concentrating on the central greenhouse dome, and you have the um, cooling. Uh, you have the uh, thermocouples on the end, and that's going to induce what would amount to a. Uh, you see, you know, here, 
um, a hydrothermal cycle. Just kind of give you the idea about how such a thing would work. And it's, uh, so again, hydrothermal convection. You guys kind of get the idea. Uh, low trenches connect with these things act like nodes. Uh, that's why I call it a, one, one word for it is a harbor engine. Um, and the way it would work is it actually would be an engine for your, for your globally paired terraform system. Let's go through a bit. I actually want to skip through these just because time is of the essence. And this is a very busy conference. So two minutes. All right, real quick, I'm going to do an Occupy Venus moment. That's right. I'm, I'm in the hornet's nest now because I actually, personally, my end game would actually be to go to Venus. And you'll see why in a second. So about 100 kilometers up, you have something that's generally Earth-like, uh, temperature and pressure. Um, what you can do is take, spin the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere into graphene, combine it with some lunar mined lithium catalyst, and you actually spin graphene straight out of the atmosphere. And you can use something that's a hexagonal system. Again, using a lot of these regenerative cycling techniques. So you would create these things because um, breathable air is a lifting gas. Um, you can actually have structures that, because they're hexagonal, means you can pop one and the whole system will crash on you. Um, you could have an unbroken surface around the planet that's being spun out of the atmosphere, eventually cooling it from its own shade while at the same time providing exponentially increasing land mass. And I think it's a revolutionary way to think about Venus settlement. Um, it can be done, not with today's technology, but if you gave me a research grant of about a billion dollars, I will deliver you a Venus settlement and maybe some money to spare. And um, you know, going into uh, you know further out in the solar system, um, getting settlements spun up. One way to think about doing that is to have the people in the settlement actually invest directly in whatever that settlement is going to produce um, by getting that self uh, iteratively self-improving cycle of economics. You will have a robust space development community in your lifetimes and sooner if the money is there. And those derivatives are ultimately going to help Earth. Um, again, I'm a big uh, proponent of uh, arcologies. Um, this is one such design, uh, half of it's buried, and you can actually design this for Mars as well. Um, this would uh, support a uh, community of about 20 people. Um, you have uh, four or five uh, single family, two story houses that are actually stacked. And because you're using the hexagonal design, it's modularly expandable in either direction, and your Uber just drives to the underground parking garage. <laughs> These are some systems that we're creating based on that technology. Um, we call them modular infinity units. Grow your food, it's another one of those really cool, nifty. Uh, you know, food grow projects, because I think that's pretty awesome. I, wanna, I don't want to starve when I'm on Mars, and I want to have as many options as I can. Um, I want to be spoiled on my, I, as an American, I feel like I enjoy being spoiled when I go to the supermarket. I like to see what we can do to bring abundance to space, because n by no means do you have to be roughing it. And I believe that is my talk. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Oh, okay. time? Perfect. Um, who wants to go first? Uh, you, sir. I'm just going to go uh, right to left. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a, 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 you talk about terraforming model. There's a model of the Earth's shale. Is that what it is? I am not, actually. I guess the biological system would almost be kind of uh, exponentially expanding once you get that kind of runaway effect happening then. Exactly. Do you think that's why we had a snowball Earth like, uh, like right yeah, before that? Yeah, that's really interesting actually. Well, I, really, really quickly, it's in, it's I need to check it. Symbiotic Planet? Yeah. We're going we're gonna to definitely try to find that on Amazon. <laughs> All right, next question please. Sure. Uh, sir. Oh, you. Yeah, what, um, I, I love your spike uh, sea launch uh, idea. Now, on, on for your Mars colony, uh, how are you going to keep uh, micrometeorites from uh, breaking your, the, uh, the dome? I guess, well, what I, what I like about a geodesic dome is even if you get a small impact on it, it'd be easy just to send a robot maybe along the outside, just have a replacement panel that you can just you know run up, you know, pop in. You probably have a big red flashing light, and everybody would have to go to their nearest air supply, you know, receptacle or, you know, find, you know, find a, uh, whatever, I guess, emergency contingencies would realistically have to be planned out, you know, for such a structure. But once that's taken care of, a robot can just, you know, go along the outside of the dome, maybe pull out the old one, put in the new one, and then seal it. That's how I'd imagine that'd probably have to work out. Cool. Um, 
sir. Nice. That maybe maybe you can use the structural support of the Thank you. That, that's very intelligent. I really like that actually. That's cool. Uh, Daniel or uh, go sir. The solid degradation poses a problem for sea launches? Um, it depends on what you're using. We have some really good, uh, we actually have a really brilliant uh, material scientist who's uh, talking about joining the board right now uh, to work with us. Um, there, as long as you are, for example, chromium is corrosion resistant. Um, it also makes a really shiny rocket. Um, not, not trying to be facetious or, or joking, but it's, you'd have a shiny rocket, it'd be chromium. Um, but you can also use other materials as well. You can treat it. You can treat it. Um, if you have any insights to that, we'd be happy to hear it because we're building on as, it now. As in your, um, the board, as in the infrastructure, you, not the rocket itself, but the infrastructure. The oh, I see what you mean. Um, that's actually been uh, brought up, and uh, that we can talk to we can talk about that afterward. But that we've had discussions in relate to that specific question. Um, I have one more question. Right. Do you, uh, I noticed the sea launch. Do you need a rail of some sort underwater to direct it? Um, um, what you use is actually that ballast cap here. I can maybe I can just bring it up. Just see if I can find it within like the next minute that I got. What I'm wondering. Yeah. Um, I think I would say you want it to be oriented vertically because not long after la launch, it's going to be doing whatever corrections. This the um, air spike itself is going to be gimbaled six degrees. To allow you to allow you to make whatever corrections you need to get on the right, you know, trajectory. Thank you. So, yeah, I think. Uh, are we um, we're we're looking we're looking at a um, LOX methane combination, maybe LOX H2. Uh, LOX H2. Uh, the good thing about that is that you can actually do it on site using electrolysis. In fact, the original uh, plans were to use a uh, Navy uh, aircraft carrier that's nuclear powered uh, to generate the amount of uh, fuel needed, and that's in the original. Uh, C yeah, Sea Dragon design. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks, guys.